Garrison, as Street Matter points out, then moved to Boston and began publishing in 1831 what emerged as the archetype of advocacy journalism in American history, The Liberator. The Liberator was published weekly from January 1st, 1831 to January 1st, 1866. Garrison did not cease publication until his mission had been accomplished. Although the Liberator never had a huge circulation, it was only about a thousand in the early years and never rose above 3,000 subscriptions, 2,500 of which were paid. Garrickson's success as a provocateur gained him a national notoriety. As, as Street Matter points out, Garrison succeeded by setting off a series of editorial chain reactions, as Street Matter calls them. That is, he would publish his abolitionist pieces and then exchange papers with a hundred other editors. And in the process, he would anger editors of pro-slavery newspapers who would, in responding to Garrison, repeat many of Garrison's ideas, sometime quote him extensively, so that Garrison achieved a much wider reach than just the circulation of the Liberator. Uh, one measure of Garrison's success is perhaps the response of the states and sometimes local governments in slaveholding states to Garrison's publication. And those responses suggest a sense that Garrison posed a real threat. The state of Georgia placed a $5,000 bounty on Garrison's head. A group in Mississippi placed a $20,000 bounty on his head uh, in the city of Columbia, South Carolina. There was a $1,500 reward. Even in nearby Georgetown, in D.C., uh, which uh, was you know, the to be the capital of the Union after the war breaks out, of course, blacks were prohibited from receiving the paper. Another state response was that of the postmaster general uh, whose sympathies were pro-slavery. Uh, Amos Kendall actually condoned the destruction of the paper within the postal system. And keep in mind that postal system was created in part to ensure the, dis the dissemination of newspapers to as much of the population as possible. Uh, it was a uh, designed, in part at least, as a subsidy of the press. In 1844, Garrison called for non-slaveholders to secede from the Union, writing the motto inscribed on the banner of freedom should be no union with slaveholders. Garrison had a flair for the spectacle. In 1854, at a July 4th celebration, he burned a copy of the Constitution, calling the Constitution itself a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Keep in mind that Constitution contained three sections that defended slavery. Other abolitionist papers of the middle of that century included Horace Greeley's New York Tribune with a 
much larger circulation than the Liberator, but keep in mind this was a general circulation newspaper that was not devoted to the single cause of abolition, uh, as you know, was the case with Joseph Medill's Chicago Tribune. Uh, both of these newspapers supported the abolitionist cause as part of their editorial stance, and while you know, they weren't devoted to the cause of abolition, they nevertheless played a very important role because in part of their large circulation they helped to popularize the ideas of the abolitionist press. In March of 1857, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott decision that slaves had to be returned to their masters from non-slave territory. Slavery is now national, the Chicago Tribune editorialized. Freedom has no local habitation nor abiding place save in the hearts of free men. Illinois in law has ceased to be a free state. This gives you a sense of the role that local papers could play. Not all of them did. Some of them took no position. That is, they supported neither the pro-slavery nor the abolitionist cause, and others were decidedly pro-slavery. But in this case, the Chicago Tribune could make it clear to the people of Illinois that they had lost a part of their sovereignty as a result of the interpretation of the Fugitive Slave Act, as a result of the Supreme Court ruling in the Dred Scott decision, they were complicit in the institution of slavery so long as they were legally obligated to return escaped slaves to their masters. Medill worked tirelessly for the election of Abraham Lincoln as president and grimly set himself and his newspaper to support the savage war that followed Lincoln's election. His fervor for the Union cause was put to the test. Two of his brothers were killed in the Civil War. While Street Matter acknowledges the role of Medill and the Chicago Tribune as an advocate of abolition, Mott's account of Medill forces us to recognize that other work was being done that was important to, if not centrally focused on, the cause of abolition. Uh, we'll look later at the work of Thomas Nast as a cartoonist in the context of you know, bringing down the corrupt Tweed Ring, but Nast as a cartoonist was extremely important to the re-election of Abraham Lincoln, which of course was a key factor in the ability of the North to maintain the war, and by extension then to fulfill the goal of abolitionists like Garrison. Uh, another important development in the growth of the abolitionist press is the emergence of African-American journalists. African-American newspapers come into being prior to the Civil War in the early stages of the abolitionist cause. In 1827, the first African-American periodical Freedom's Journal is started by Samuel Cornish and John B. Russworm, and in it they specifically tell the world, we wish to plead our own cause. 
too long have others spoken for us. And it's important to recognize that to have others speak for you is to be seen as subordinate to be seen as almost childlike, to need someone to speak on your behalf is to recognize the superiority of that someone uh, rather than to be able to be self-defining, to speak for yourself and to say, this is the cause of our people. So to have African American voices speak with a particular legitimacy with a particular set of contributions to the cause of abolition is an important development in the growth of the abolitionist press. Freedom's Journal initiated the trend of African American papers throughout the United States to fight for liberation and rights, demonstrate racial pride, and inform readers of events affecting the African-American community. Freedom Journal, unfortunately, for lack of advertising support, ceased publication in 1829. You can imagine the challenges faced by African-American editors trying to fund a newspaper. The first major African-American voice and the abolitionist cause is, interestingly enough, that of a black woman, not a black man. Maria Stewart's first essay, Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality, the Sure Foundation on Which We Must Build, was published in 1831 in the abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. This was the first political manifesto written by an African-American woman. Cast your eyes about, wrote Stuart. Look as far as you can see. All, all is owned by the lordly white, except here and there a lowly dwelling which the man of color, midst deprivations, fraud, and opposition, has been scarce able to procure. Like King Solomon, who put neither nail nor hammer to the temple, yet received the praise, so also have the white Americans gained themselves a name, like the names of the great men that are in the earth, while in reality we have been their principal foundation and support. In 1832, 16 years ahead of the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, points out street matter, Stewart publicly mounted a platform in Boston to give a political speech. The first time an American-born woman, African-American or white, had done so.